Welcome to the joys of being an expanded community, knowing that we are worshiping together here in this room and that we are worshiping um, uh, with our siblings in Christ online up and down the West Coast and across the country. Um, how wonderful, how wonderful to be together. We are moving through the season of fall with this theme, a place for you here. You know, those words that we say that we come from a diverse uh, array of spiritualities and so that we hope wherever you are on your spiritual journey that you find that there is a place for you here. So we're thinking about what that means, a place for you here. And for the next two weeks, we're going to thinking of, be thinking about that with particularity as we think of the earth as our home. So we'll do that in worship. And then I will, I'll talk a little bit more um, next Sunday in the afternoon. We're going to have uh, the chance to gather with folks from Project ADAPT, the, ADAPT, the Marin Interfaith Council, Congregation Road of Shalom, and Westminster Presbyterian Tiburon for an experience thinking about who we want to be as the climate changes, who we want to be as we think about how we continue as the earth with the earth as our home in our time and our day. After pausing to both praise and curse technology, we gather in the body of Christ. Please join me in the call to worship. Praise God. Praise God from the heavens. Praise God in the heights above. Praise God, sun and moon. Praise God, all you shining stars. For God commanded, and they were created. Praise God from the earth. Praise God, all you creatures of the deep. Praise God, mountains, hills, and trees. Praise God, every living thing that lives on earth. Praise God, all humanity, youth, and elders, all people of every gender and nation. For God's splendor is in all the earth and heavens. Come. Let's join the mighty chorus that the morning stars began. Come, let us worship God. Come, let's worship God, and I invite us to rise in body or in spirit as we sing together for the beauty of the earth.
as we celebrate God's great creation, we know the ways we continue to harm the earth. Let us pray together for God's healing help. Loving Christ, there is no pain in our hearts or on our planet that you do not know, for you have touched the lowest places on earth. Teach us to grieve with you, O Christ, the loss of all the beauty that is being destroyed. There is no place in the heavens that cannot be touched by your resurrection presence, for you fill all things. Give us strength in your victory over death to grow into your way of love, which does not end in our experience of despair, but keeps sowing seeds of love. In Christ, God has knit together into one body every bit of creation. Teach us to know our interconnectedness with all things. Teach us to grow with each other and all living creatures in love. In Jesus' name we pray. Please join me as we affirm and give thanks for God's abounding grace. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Today, in Christ, you are a new creation. Today, in Christ, all creation is made new. There is a place for you here in this new creation. Breathe in this new life and live. Thanks be to God. With Christ's own courage and compassion, may we begin our new life in this new creation today. Amen. Amen. And breathing in that new life, uh, this is the time in worship where we exchange signs of Christ's peace with each other. So the first thing we'll do is I'm going to put a spotlight here on the in-person congregation so we can wave peace to our siblings in Christ who are worshiping in there. Some of them, are, my mom is waving back to us, peace of Christ. And so if you're online in just a moment, Mary Catherine's going to uh, allow you to unmute yourselves so that you can exchange words of peace with each other as here in this room, we exchange words and signs of Christ's peace with each other here. Friends, may the peace of Christ be with you. Everybody, <laughs> 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 Georgia, in the sanctuary. What wonderful sounds of peace. This is the time in our worship service that's led by our children. Um, so this time is especially for you, June Everett Anders, Cece Paula, Shiha, Shihu, Shira, Cecilia, Phoebe, Quentin, Hannah, Isaac, Frank, Gwen, Olivia, Charlotte, L, Ashley, Nate, Theo, Claire, Gavin, whether you are a child or a child at heart, whether you are with us online, or whether you are here in this room starting to move towards your seats, this time is for you. There is a place for you up here. I see, she, I see Ashley, excellent, and Sheha, Shehu, and Shira, excellent. Yay.
I did call you up here. Okay. Hello, hello, hello. It's so good to see everybody. Oh my gosh. Good to see you. Did you have a good week? I had a good couple of weeks. You know, I went to New York City and so I had a good time there and did some good work there, but I'm glad to be back. I'm glad to be back in California. So today um, in church, and I think in Sunday school too, we're going to be talking about creation. And here in the sanctuary, we're going to be talking about how much we love creation, but also sometimes how we have hurt creation. And so we're going to talk about global warming, which I bet you've ta heard about in school. And we're going to talk about how we can take care of the earth. And so when we talk about serious things like that, I think sometimes it's good to remember why we take care of creation and specifically to remember the things we love about creation. So I brought some of the things that I love about creation. And I love, you know, I love just the sights and the smells and the way creation can feel sometimes. So here's the first one. So this is a sight. Can you tell what that is? What is it? It's a whale. So this came, this came from Maui and it's two whales. Yeah, it's a mama whale and a baby whale and they travel together. They travel together all the time. And so I've been out on a boat where a whale has come right up to the edge and on one boat where a whale came right towards us and went under us and came up on the other side. It was both scary and a whole lot of fun. You should have heard the adults on that boat squeal as that that um, uh, whale went underneath us. Okay, so this is this is a smell of nature. And I'm not. Can you can you smell? Can you smell that? Do I need to open it up a little bit more? Miss Ann is going to know what this is immediately. <laughs> Did you smell that? Did you smell it? Does anybody know what that is? Anne? Lavender close. Oh my gosh, you're getting, you're so close. Can we oh, wait. Exactly. I got a rosemary. I got a rosemary. So yeah, you can, you can pass it around. Yeah. Yeah. You can take a little bit of this if you want, like, like Miss Anne's doing. Here you go. So rosemary is, I guess it's an herb, yeah. an herb. And I love to use it when it's, when I'm cooking because it has such, such a great smell and such a great flavor. Okay, now, so this one, this is how nature feels. So I promise you this is safe. Does anybody want to reach in and feel, see if you can tell what that is in there? You can just reach in, reach in the bag. Yeah, sand, exactly. So I went, I had one more day off when I got back from New York. So I went to the beach mainly to collect sand. I love the beach. I love being out there just for you. Yeah. And, and to be at the beach because it was fun. So what, um, and I think Miss Reverend Grace has something that she likes about nature too. This is a leaf. I pick it up in front of my door. Uh, there is a these leaves tree, but actually I don't know the tree's name. Everybody know the tree's name? <laughs> acacia, acacia maybe is what Miss Ann is saying. I know, little bell flowers. Yeah. But hummingbirds often come and eat. Then mm. so, I think and this tree is a hummingbird meal table. Then so, I can see this tree and a hummingbird uh, at the living room, my couch or second floor in my room. And also I like uh, hiking too, to see trees. Then so, uh, looking at the trees, and then I, it is a great moment for exercising and then taking deep breath. Yeah. And when I breathe while looking at the tree and I feel the tree and then I are breathing together, like a nature connecting breath in God or creation. Grace, I love that. We're breathing together with all creation. You know, let's just do that. Let's just breathe in with all creation and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. Amen. 
Amen. So think about think about something that you like in creation and maybe give thanks for it. And I know you're going to talk about that in your children's time. But we have one thing left to do before we finish up our time here. What is that? Pretzel prayer. Who would like to lead it? Anybody? Ashley would like to read it. So Grace, can you give Ashley the mic, please? Excellent. And it's on. We will follow you and we'll help out too if you need. Okay. God, God I love you. Help me to love others. Help me to love others. As you love me. As you love me. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for leading us. That was awesome. So as we move into two uh, scriptures, two scriptures that deal with creation, one from the Old Testament, it's a prophet, it's Jeremiah, so get ready for that one. And then uh, Romans, uh, that beautiful all creation groaning, um, groaning with us, groaning together. So as we think about creation, all that we love about creation, and also are aware of the harm that we've done, listen in these scriptures for the despair that you hear and listen for the hope, but maybe what be, may be most obvious is listen for the groaning. Our first scripture reading comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 12, verses 10 through 13. Many shepherds have destroyed my vineyard. They have trampled down my portion. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They have made it a desolation. Desolate. It mourns to me. The whole land is made desolate. But no one lays it to heart. Upon all bare heights in the desert, spoilers have come. For the sword of the Lord devours from one end of the land to the other, no one shall be safe. They have sown wheat and have reaped thorns. They have tired themselves out, but profit nothing. They shall be ashamed of their harvest because of God's fierce anger. Thank you. 
Our second scripture lesson this morning comes from Romans 8, 18 through 27. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits in eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. In hope, the creation itself will be set free from its enslavement to decay and will obtain freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know the whole creation has been groaning together as it suffers the pains of labor. And not only creation, but we ourselves, who are the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, for redemption of our bodies. For in hope, we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what one has already seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with groans too deep for words. And God, who searches hearts, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We celebrate the written word of Scripture. Thanks be to God. <laughs> we celebrate the living word, Christ among us. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. <clears throat> Loving God, your spirit groans in us. Your spirit breathes in us. Your spirit lives in us. In this moment of new creation, may we experience and inhabit and embody your word for the blessing of the world you love so very much. Amen. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. Those are the opening lines to A Tale of Two Cities, yes, by Charles Dickens. I first encountered those opening lines in eighth or ninth grade English, and I was perplexed. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Those are polar opposites. So too are wisdom and foolishness, light and darkness, hope and despair. They are opposites. They cannot both be true at the same time. You gotta pick one. Best of times, worst of times, hope, despair. Which is it? Those opening lines invited me into my first conscious experience of paradox. Paradox. An experience where two seemingly opposite things appear to be true at the very same time. An experience that opened my eyes to the reality that life is not always, if ever, strictly either or. Maybe even more often, life is bewilderingly both and, filled with seemingly contradictory things that are true at the same time. As we consider this morning the earth as our home and look for our place here, we enter into what we might call an existential paradox. We know what we have done to our planet. The damage done through carbon emissions from the start of the Industrial Revolution until now, we know the trajectory, and as we think of the earth as our home, we can be filled, perhaps overwhelmed with grief for things lost and for things we have yet to lose. And 
At the same time, even as we are filled with this existential grief, real and true, we also rise every morning to the beauty of a brand new day, to a sunrise, to the quiet song of birds, to a bright blue sky, to the next new breath. This week, during one of my walks, I had a small deer walk alongside me for two whole blocks. It wasn't right up next to me, but it was a few feet away. It just kind of strolled along with me. We experience the earth as our home, and we are filled with awe or gratitude or, dare I say it, even joy. As we think of earth as our home in 2023, we are regularly filled with both profound grief and the promise of each new day. Most days, we live somewhere between despair and hope. Days where the two sometimes converge and come upon us at the very same time, despair and hope, seemingly contradictory experience of life, both true at the same time. This morning's Old Testament text goes with us into the experience of despair, into the worst of times. Jeremiah is doing what prophets do, one of the central things that prophets do. They announce the things in the world that are coming to an end. The oppressive systems, the injustice, every wasting way that harms and kills. We know how the prophets indict their major themes, the vital things. You trample on the poor and the vulnerable. You use dishonest scales. You abuse the stranger in your midst. And they say all this, all this is coming to an end. God stands for justice and for life. Prophets say, this is what is inevitable if current trends continue. I hadn't fully appreciated until this week how much the prophets' indictments also have to do with the wasting of the land, the destruction of creation. That's Jeremiah's focus in this morning's text and a repeating theme throughout the book of Jeremiah. He comes back to it again and again. You see, Jeremiah is living in and around the destruction of Jerusalem as the Babylonian is about to and then does march in. Jeremiah is there before it happens, saying it's on the way. He's there as the city falls And he speaks into and out of captivity, his own and that of the people. Jeremiah says to the people and the powers, they have created systems and structures so corrupt and rotted from within that they are sure to collapse. As that happens, Jeremiah looks around and says true things. The whole land is in ruins, can't you see? God says, many shepherds have trampled the vineyards. You've turned my pleasant fields into a desolate wasteland. Look even to the barren heights. Destroyers swarm in. Is there any place you have not defiled? You've made a desolation of the land and desolate. It mourns to me. Can you picture that? Can you hear it? The land mourns to God. And the prophet's words flow into lament. Hearing just the snippet of Jeremiah's lament, it's not a stretch to name our own desolation, to feel our own despair, to hear in our day the land lament. We are a community that looks with open eyes and open hearts at the science of our climate crisis and the trajectory of collapse. We seek to find our place there, our place here, and to find ways of living lives of meaning there, here. After worship this morning, Royce will lead a Sunday seminar that will go into more detail, but we have acknowledged the arc of things here before. Drawing from the latest UN report and commentary from two of its lead authors, we know the enormity of climate crisis. We know that some of the changes unleashed by our carbon emissions, particularly in our oceans and frozen places, are now irreversible. We've passed 1.2 degrees warming. That is, the world is 1.2 degrees, more than 1.2 degrees Celsius warmer than it was at the start of the Industrial Revolution. 
at 1.2 degrees warmer, we are already experiencing climate disruptions, superstorms, a summer with record high temperatures, an increase in climate refugees. I'm just back from New York City where we had a day of unprecedented flooding. The science indicates that we're on track to reach 1.5 degrees Celsius in, early, in the early 2030s and 2 degrees as early as the 2040s. At 1.5 degrees, we can expect a number of ecosystems to reach their adaptive limits more than they can bear. And somewhere between 2 and 3 degrees, we can expect the Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheets to disappear, accompanied by 2 to 10 meters in rise in sea level. A quarter of a billion people live on land less than 2, two meters above sea level. These st statistics are conservative. And what Royce will share later will probably be even more up-to-date than these are. Joel Gerges, a scientist who was one of the lead authors of the UN's latest report, says that it's important to name and grasp the enormity of this crisis, not to throw our hands up and to give up, but to be clear-eyed. There are some changes we have unleashed that are irreversible. Our collective effort to date has not been sufficient to stop major components of collapse. But Gerges writes, how bad we let it get is still in our hands. Edward Carr, another lead author of the report, says it's important to understand all this because it's important to understand that it's too late for just incremental change. He says that so that we might grasp that what is needed is nothing less than transformational change. The complete transforming of the economic and political systems that have got us here. Prophets stand in the reality of the world and say true things and they call out the things that are coming to an end, the things that must come to an end. But that's not all prophets do. Remember, they announce what must come to an end, but the biblical prophets also announce the new thing that is coming to life, the new thing that God is bringing to life, even in our desolation, even in our despair. Something is coming to an end. Something is coming to life, both true at the same time. Living in the tension of that paradox opens up the opportunity of turning away from systems that are ending and turning toward the new thing. The prophet makes clear the necessity of that turning. That turning opens up the possibility, even of in our despair, the possibility for hope. Now, something else that I've learned in the past few weeks is that hope is getting a bad rap. Even within the climate action community, uh, Rebecca Solnit, uh, of a local writer, has launched a project and edited a book with Thelma Lutanutabua called Not Too Late, with essays from climate scientists and activists. They argue for hope and take on what they call climate doomers, who they characterize unfairly, I think, as unhelpfully defeatist. Now, those who take seriously climate collapse have taken umbrage, understandably, and they insist we must speak honestly about science and the trajectory of collapse. They respond essentially, hope will not help us here. I've even heard and read folks say, I've given up on hope. And I get that. I like how Jem Bendel, whom a number of us read and follow, sifts through all this. He speaks in terms of forms of hope. Bendel takes on, head on, with no apology, empty, facile hope. Hope that ignores the realities of science. But he also notices that different people mean different things when they say hope. There are ways of evoking hope that are not helpful. If hope means, oh, just hope for the best, there's no need to do anything, well, that's not helpful. 
But across the writers I've read this week and for the past few years, each articulates, each in their own way, a form of hope that can ground us even in our grieving, even in our despair. Bendel calls this hope beyond hope. Solnit calls it hope in the dark. Joanna Macy calls it active hope. For our conversation this morning, let's call it real hope. And remember, when we're talking about hope here, here in this room, in this community, we are always ultimately talking about our hope in God, the hope that we find in Jesus Christ. So let's say what hope is not. Hope is not the same thing as optimism. Optimism is the perspective that things will turn out okay pretty much no matter what. It envisions that certain rosy results are inevitable and moves forward as if they will happen. Optimism is about as useful as pessimism, which is to say, not very. Pessimism says everything will turn out bad, so why bother working for good? Optimism says everything will turn out okay, why bother worrying about the hard realities? Real hope is not the same thing as optimism. It doesn't assume rosy results. In fact, real hope doesn't depend on results at all. A number of these writers point to the way that Václav Havel has articulated. And it's amazing. Almost every single one of them points to Václav Havel's articulation. He said, hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well. Hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something is worth doing no matter how it turns out. Real hope Let's go of needing to control the way the world works out. It acknowledges the things that are beyond our control, the consequences we have already set in motion, standing, but then standing in the world as it is. Real hope faces all that and also sees a greater good at work. No matter what the circumstances, whether we call that good God or Christ, as we do here, or whether we call it the human community, Jim Bendel puts it this way. This is a quote from his book. There is something else entirely that some people are alluding to when they speak of hope, which is a kind of faith about the ultimate rightness of all things, no matter what occurs. Personally, he says, I have that kind of faith. It's a faith that is also encouraged by multiple religions that encourage us towards living lovingly without attachment to outcome. That kind of religious hope is not involving a wish or an expectation or even a realistic possibility, but a deeper knowing in us of the nature of reality and thus an instinct for living lovingly. Of course, we speak of that form of hope here in terms of Christ. Hope is not wishful thinking. It's not wishing the world were, uh, that the world were other than it is. Hope is not Tinkerbell dancing through the world, sprinkling fairy dust so that the world is magically made right. Hope, real hope, begins in a groan. We hear that in this morning's Romans text. Hope begins in groans too deep for words. Hope enters into the world, into the midst of the suffering of the world, and it doesn't look away. It enters into the pain of the world and groans. And it's not just any groan, it's the groan of all creation. We know that the whole of creation has been groaning is in the pains of childbirth up until now. In Romans... The Apostle Paul, throughout the book of Romans, is speaking of the grand sweep of things. The God who created all creation in Jesus Christ has entered into creation and set it free. What God was doing all along, creating and recreating and loving, God is doing in Jesus Christ. And in the power of resurrection, God is doing that now in the body of Christ in us. 
The place for us here is always, always in the body of Christ. And here, as we're speaking, the body of Christ is our place in all creation, an integrated, interconnected part of all creation, the new creation groaning as we birth together something new. And look carefully in the text. What is creation groaning for? For the children of God to be revealed. Creation is groaning for the children of God to show up. To be who we were created to be. A new creation groaning and loving and healing in and with a hurting world. When we have these conversations here, the question always comes up, as it should, but what can we do? What can I do? It's a question that I've come to hear almost like a lament. Ours is an ongoing conversation, so here on this Sunday, I'll share a bit of what I see today, particularly from my reading over the last few weeks. I think these climate scientists and activists are suggesting that one of the things we need to do first is to name what we can't do and lament. They insist that we acknowledge the severity of climate crisis and collapse and realize that there are some impacts that are irreversible. They invite us to grieve that, to groan and live in the world that is before us doing the good we can do the good we must. That's one thing. The climate scientists I've mentioned point us to the big work. What did, what did Edward Carr say? The time for incremental change is past. We must collectively engage in transformational change, transforming systems. We've been a part of that before. Our anti-racism movement, our movements for justice, we need to use the activist muscles we have developed in other struggles here to face the big issues and to make our leaders do what is needed. It's the second thing. And then, some of the climate activists I've mentioned, they invite us to stand in the reality of climate collapse and tend to the hurt that is unfolding even now. To be fully present, asking, how can I help? How can I assist in lessening the suffering as the collapse process intensifies? How can I be here to comfort others and remain calm in my acceptance, steadfast, even when things are grim? How can I help in the wake of fires and storms and floods? How can I help as there are more and more climate refugees? Those are just three things in our continuing conversation. But I want to suggest that even before we reach that question, what can we do, that we sit with the question that my friend and colleague Lauren Van Ham asks, and that is, who will we be? Who will I be? Who will we be as the climate changes? Next Sunday afternoon, we'll have the opportunity to experience that question together with folks who will gather here from the Marin Interfaith community, from Congregation Rodef Shalom, from Westminster Presbyterian in Tiburon, from the Project Adapt community and other faith communities. We will gather in reverence. In our love for and interconnectedness and creation, we'll go on a bit of a pilgrimage together with opportunities for meditation, experiencing nature. And here in this room, we will be, be witness to Peter's uh, photography from Standing Rock. We'll, we'll do that in worship and then also in that afternoon experience. Somewhere between despair and hope. Somewhere between despair and hope, somewhere in the midst of despair and hope, there is a place for you. There is a place for us here in all that is. 
It's grounded in the groaning of all creation and in the conviction that the God who created all that is accompanies their creation in love, always has, always will. And in all that groaning, hope. Hope is not about controlling the results. Hope trusts that God is at work, that we are a part of that work, and that work is worth doing regardless of the result. Hope is groaning and grieving and loving and living and engaging the work that is ours to do. We live in the paradox of our times. As creation groans for the children of God to appear, hope is showing up in the midst of hard realities, part of God's new creation. Hope is showing up in the midst of all that and coming to life. Friends, that's a lot to take in. Um, every day it's a lot to take in. In this moment, it's a lot to take in. So um, let's do what the kids recommended and take a deep breath and breathe out. Breathe in together with all creation and breathe out. And we'll move into prayer where we will pray in song and silence and then in words. Friends, let us be together in prayer. Creating, redeeming, loving, healing, saving God, we give you praise. You created all that is in love. From the chaos and the depths, you shaped a world, sky and sea and earth. You set the lights in the sky, sun and moon and stars, and breathe life into every living thing, plants and grasses and trees, the fish that swim, the birds that fly, and all the creatures that walk and crawl the earth, and us, even us, you created us and said that all this, all this was good. Your goodness is planted in your creation more deeply than all that is wrong. And down through time, you accompany all you create. We give you thanks and praise. Help us to see the world as you see it, the world you long for, a world with healing for every broken bit of us. We pray for a world in climate collapse and acknowledge all the ways that we have harmed the earth. 
Help us change our ways on the grand scale that is needed and in those parts of collapse already unfolding, help us see the work of help and healing that is ours to do. We pray for peace in Israel, Palestine, in the Ukraine. We pray for peace that comes with justice, for peace that recognizes the dignity and humanity of every person. We pray for those harmed by every system of oppression, particularly American systemic racism. Help us to see the ways we are complicit and stop. Teach us to look to those who have been harmed the most and learn and join them in the work of dismantling and then rebuilding. We pray for all those who are hungry, for food enough and more, for those who are unhoused or far from home, safe shelter, for those who mourn, comfort, for those who are ailing in body or spirit, healing, for every lament, your tender mercy. Help us to see the world as you see it and then say yes to helping you make it so. In both despair and hope, we join our voices to the voices of all who have ever called your name, praying the prayer that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And again, welcome. We are so glad you're here, whether you're here with us in this room or with us online. A special welcome to everyone uh, who may be visiting us for the first time or one of the first times. We'd love to get to know you better. Uh, so if you're online, feel free to uh, leave your email address in the chat and it'll work its way to me. Or you can email me at scottclark at togetherweserve.org, scottclark at togetherweserve.org. And if you're in the room with us here, I hope that I'll get the chance to speak with you and that we'll be able to visit either at the door or um, at coffee hour across the way in Duncan Hall. Um, we have, I've, uh, immediately after church, we have the Sunday seminar um, also on, on climate, climate crisis and collapse and our um, living lives of deep adaptation that Royce is going to lead. It will be in the fireside room. At 11.45, at 11.45, thank you. And so it'll be, we'll remember we're going back to our usual way of doing this, where if you're online, we're going to close down uh, the worship Zoom, and then we'll open it right back up. So there'll be two different Zooms, but it's the same link that you have here. So somewhere between 11.30 and 11.45, we'll do that. But we'll gather back in person and on Zoom uh, for that important conversation. Uh, and uh, we have... Next Sunday, we have the um, event here, the interfaith event, event where we'll consider who will we, we be. My friend and colleague that I quoted in the sermon, she's actually here with us, uh, Lauren Van Ham. And uh, Royce and, and so many of us are so grateful for Lauren's partnership in these long conversations and worthy conversations and all that Lauren and her partner in this work, Steve, do um, to help us be real and to help us find purpose in difficult times. Lauren, we're, I'm grateful for you, and we're grateful to have you here with us in this room. Thank you. Um, extended a greeting. One other thing, if you'd like to become a member of this church, uh, rem uh, uh, we have uh, new members uh, gathering after church on October 22nd. There are a couple of you that I've spoken to, but if I haven't, uh, please feel free to let me know or let Jillian know. We'd love to welcome you to find out more about the church, and then at that point, if you decide to, to join, we, we would welcome you in, in, in that official way, knowing that you are welcome to be in this church and part of this community however you want to show up. There is a place for you here. We have plenty of opportunities to um, be together over the course of the week in the interest of time. We'll just show... Um, them up on the screen briefly, all of the regular opportunities to be together to pray and connect. We also have our opportunities to gather in our justice work, probably in the next coming week. The most important one of those is the Sunday event, two o'clock next Sunday. Um, also next Sunday worship, come. 
uh, Peter's going to Peter Anderson's going to transform this place into a gallery of his photography from Standing Rock, um, and we'll experience that in worship not only not only in the afternoon, but but in worship. And I just got to tell you, it's amazing. It's amazing to hear um, that gentle, wise, and courageous member of our community speak about his experiences at Standing Rock. As we share in our life of community, our life of prayer, our life of justice, we also share the resources that we have. In just a moment, we'll take up our offering, um, either online uh, through the website or here in this room, pooling together uh, and, and giving back a little bit of what God has entrusted to our care, knowing that we can do more together than we can ever do alone. And as we do that, as we receive the morning offering, we also have carved out a time in our worship uh, for an intentional practice of gratitude. So as we're lift, receiving our morning offering, there's also an invitation to lift up your prayers of thanks. What is one thing today, one thing today for which you are grateful? Friends, we'll now receive our morning offering and let us be together in prayer. Friends, let's rise in body or in spirit as we continue to affirm the goodness of God's creation planted far more deeply than all that is wrong as we sing together, God, you spin the whirling planets. Verses one and three.
Friends, let's go now into the world to breathe in and to breathe out with all creation. To breathe in knowing that we are the new creation, created to love and heal the world God loves so very much. And as we go from this place, we go knowing that we go Christ above us, Christ below us, Christ behind us, Christ before us, Christ beside and all around us, Christ within us. Go in peace.